One of the topics in chapter nine has to do with loss contingencies. Well, actually loss and gain contingencies. We saw this a little bit in chapter two, although you may have missed it because there was so, so much theoretical material in chapter two. But I wanna take a look at it. We've also have looked at loss contingencies in chapter seven with the accounts receivable. So let's review it a little bit. Uh, contingencies. Well, that's something that's contingent on a future event. So we might have a, a gain, you know, depending on what happens in the future, it may end up with a gain or something may happen in the future where we end up with a loss. A good example of a loss contingency is a lawsuit. So if we have a customer that has sued us, um, if we, you know, it may be in the future, if we lose that lawsuit, we'll have a loss. Well, that's a loss contingency. So if we have these contingencies, if we think it's gonna be a gain, we don't report it, but we do have the option of disclosing it in the notes to the financial statements. On the other hand, if we think we're gonna have a loss, we will report it if it meets two criteria. One, it's probable that the loss will occur. Again, that's rather judgmental, isn't it? But we have reason to believe that the company is going to incur the loss. So if a customer had sued us, and on December 31st, we talked to our attorneys, the attorneys tell us it's likely we're going to lose this lawsuit, then that is a probable loss. Secondly, we have to be able to estimate it. Can we reasonably estimate the dollar amount? If the lawsuit, we just have no idea how much we're going to lose, then we can't report it, can we? We can't come up with a number to put in the financial statements. We still would disclose it, but we wouldn't be able to report it. So it has to meet those two criteria. Okay, well, let's go to on to exercise 10. Exercise 10 is a purchase commitment. It's where uh, we say we're the Indi Indigo girls and we have entered into contracts with our supplier and one of the con or the contracts in total allow us to buy 36,000 gallons of raw materials at three dollars each. Well you could understand if we think there's going to be a shortage of these goods why we would want to have a purchase commitment. It locks us in at three dollars and we are guaranteed from our suppliers to be able to purchase from them 36,000 ga 36, gallons at three dollars each that gives us some security in the future. So that's the situation. So let's look at in A, that's what happened. In 2014, we entered into these purchase commitments and uh, for $3 each. Now, at the end of 2014, if we were to buy those goods in the market, it would cost us $3.30. Well, that would tell us then we made a good decision, didn't we? We're gonna be able to buy it for $3 when we want to buy it instead of 330. So we kind of really, we actually have an economic gain here. However, we're not really going to disclose that, uh, or report that. We will disclose on December 31st, we won't report this gain, rather we will disclose the gain if we want to in the, in the notes to the financial statements. Now let's go a step further. In 2015, we'll actually buy those goods for $3 each. When we buy them for $3 each, 36,000 gallons, the cost of our goods, our raw materials inventory will be 108, and we'll credit accounts payable 108,000 as well. Now let's move on to situation B. Situation B, it's the same purchase commitment. We enter into a contract uh, to buy goods for $3 each. Now both A and B notice there was no journal entry at the time of the purchase commitment. Even though it's a contract, it's actually executory in nature. Executory means that neither party has fulfilled any of the contract obligations. So because neither party has done anything yet, there's no journal entry to record. It's just an outstanding contract. And um, so, so let's go on. This time when we go to December 31st, prices have gone down though. So we might not be so happy with our purchase commitment. We're locked into buying it for $3 each, when at December 31st, we would only have to pay $270. That is a loss then. And if we think the $270 is going to continue into the future when we buy the goods, if we think it's probable that that, that value of the goods will stay at $270 or somewhere below $3, then we're going to report 
the loss in 2014. So in 2014, right here, December 31st, we have an unrealized holding loss. Unrealized means we haven't gotten cash. You know, there's been no cash flow yet. So it's not an actual loss yet because we haven't had any cash exchange. Holding is because we're holding the contract. So an unrealized holding loss for 10,800, right? That's the 30 cent difference, $3 minus 270. There's our 30 cents for the 36,000 gallons. And then we have some sort of estimated liability on the P commitment, and that's actually purchase commitment. So we have another account, estimated liability on the purchase commitment. Now, situation C takes us, it's, it continues on with B. So we had this market price of 270 at December 31st, and then in January 2015, we turn around and buy the goods. So uh, let's look at what's going to happen. So when we buy the goods, we're going to take, you know, the $108,000 is what we'll have to pay. That's the $3 for the 36,000 gallons. That's 108,000. Uh, we also, since we put 10800 in the estimated liability, we need to take that $0.30 cents or 10800 out of the liability. So then our raw materials costs then will be costed at the $2.70 for the 36,000 gallons. So again, that's purchase commitments or non-cancelable, right? In this case, non, get up here, non-cancelable purchase commitments. So if it's non-cancelable, it creates the opportunity for a contingency. If it's a, a gain contingency, we don't report it, but disclose it. But if we think believe we have a loss contingency, we do report that on the balance sheet and the income statement. And then the last thing I want to bring to your attention, I've kind of have gone over this, but I've also attached in your notes, here's the written narrative that the solutions manual would have written out for this particular case. So you can read it through there as well. In exercise 12, we want to look at estimating inventory. Uh, a lot of times, you know, if a company has a fire or something disastrous happens like that, they need to be able to estimate their loss for filing for insurance purposes. Or sometimes maybe, you know, it's uh, mid-year and that sort of thing, and they want to be able to estimate uh, their ending inventory, and that's assuming they're on a periodic inventory system. So anyhow, in exercise 12, uh, it asks us to use the gross profit method to do that. There are two methods to estimating inventory. Gross profit method is one of them. This one I think you'll just think is a whole lot of fun. I assigned something at the end of excuse me, at the end of chapter eight that was a good lead into this. So when you're using the gross profit method, you really have to have an understanding of solving for gross profit. So I've taken this information out of the exercise and put it into an income statement format. So sales, the sales return, and then we need to solve for uh, net sales. Cost of goods sold, we know beginning inventory. We're given purchases of 640,000. We know the freight costs coming in to buy the goods. There were purchase discounts. And then of course, we're gonna subtract ending inventory to get cost of goods sold. So we know the framework. So on the, on the gross profit method, just set up, you know, your framework for gross profit. Sales is cost of goods sold equals gross profit. So let's go through uh, and solve for some of this. So to begin with then, we can solve for net sales must have been $930,000. If net sales are 930, in A, we are to assume a gross profit percentage of 30% of sales. Well, how would they get that? Well, that's some historical trend that they've, you know, maybe the past five years, gross profit has been very close to 30% of sales. If that's the case, then we've got a reliable estimate here. So then all we have to do to arrive at gross profit, take 30% uh, of our sales of nine, net sales of 930,000 and we'll get 279,000. So I can arrive at that. Then once I know gross profit, we can solve for cost of goods sold, right? So 930,000 minus what equals 279,000? That's gonna be 651,000. Okay, then also we could arrive at goods available for sale, net these four numbers. 
that gives us 818,000. And now that we know that, we can solve for the number we're going after, and that's ending inventory. 818 minus 651 gives us 160,000. Put number three, that was the third thing we solved for. So we can arrive at gross profit, cost of goods sold, and then ending inventory. And we're done. Real easy, isn't it? And it's fun, but it really makes you learn the format of the income statement for a retailer uh, and see how we can problem solve for all these unknowns. So lots of fun. Now, it B, it said instead of percentage of sales, what if it had been a percentage of cost? Well, let's think through that. You know, here we have our net sales, uh, we subtract cost of goods sold, and we have gross profit. So of the 930000 651,000 is cost is a uh, excuse me 651,000 is the cost of the goods and then 279 is gross profit. So if sales either it's cost of goods sold or it's gross profit. That's what I'm saying here. So we could say then add these two together to get our sales. So cost of goods sold plus gross profit equals our sales. So then let's put in our 30% of cost. So we have cost of goods sold, and gross profit is going to be 30% of it, right? So cost of goods sold plus gross profit, which is really 30% of cost of goods sold, equals our sales. So then I add 100% of cost plus 30% of cost. We have 1.30 is our cost of goods sold that equals sales. So then I'm going to plug in our net sales here of 930000 and I finish out my formula. Then all I have to do is I divide each side by 1.30. All right, and then 1.30 will cancel out over here, and we will have cost of goods sold equals 715,385. So 930,000 divided by 1.30 will get that. Now, that's my method of doing this. That makes sense to me, but when you get to Wiley Plus, your author has a little bit different way of solving for this. So we'll look at that. Oh, just a minute, I got ahead of myself. Let's go through, uh, let's solve for uh, over here. If we know cost of goods sold is 715,385 and we know net sales are 930,000, let's finish this out. So gross profit would be 214,615. And then our ending inventory would be the difference here. This time, ending inventory would be 102,615, 615, instead of the 167. So if it had been 30% of sales, here's the number we would get. If it's 30% of cost, here's the number we get. Now again, uh, your textbook does it a little bit different. So I'm going to go up and use some of my space up here. Um, just a second. Okay, well, I moved my page around a little bit to give me a little extra space. But the way your author looks at it is this way. Uh, cost of goods sold is 100% of itself. And then we said gross profit, uh, that uh, gross profit would be 30% of the cost. So if we add cost of goods sold and gross profit together, that gives us 130%. Okay, so again, keep in mind, this is gross profit, and then we ultimately end up with sales here. Okay, with that reasoning, here's what your author does. He is gonna say gross profit is 30%, and sales is 130%. So again, if I want to get a gross profit percentage, I could just take, you know, you know, to get this 30%, you know, you're taking 279 divided by 930, right? We just take gross profit divided by sales. That would give us that 30%. So we're doing the same thing down here. Again, we're taking gross profit divided by sales. So gross profit divided by sales, that gives us something like 23 0.08% and that's rounding up 23.08% so under this method technique really this technique 
If we have net sales of 930,000, we could take that times our gross profit rate that I just arrived at, 23.08%. And that will give us a gross profit of 214,644. And that is what the solution says it should be. So I came up, again, with, you know, using, you know, 30% of cost, which the problem asked for, solve for it, you know, again, theoretically in a different way, and I got gross profit of 214,615, but it's in this rounding, this 30% divided by 130, because of the rounding involved in that, to arrive at this 23.08, um, we get a different number. So instead of 214,615, I got 214,644. It's kind of close, but still, enough far away that Wiley Plus would count it wrong. So, um, you know, so you're going to kind of want to stretch to that. But I do think most of you will find this reasoning here to be pretty straightforward. And hopefully you'll find this as well. The thing is, is that the method used in Wiley Plus required you to round, which gives you a different number. And that's what I wanted to show. Again, I think you'll find the gross profit method to be lots of fun.